Well, Matthew chapter 25, we are five weeks into the Olivet Discourse, what we've been calling Jesus' Prophecy Conference. And I was thinking about how to anchor this text. And our missionaries to Tanzania came to mind. Many of you know Stephen Susan Venton with Village Schools International. But what you may not know is that it was not their choice to be in the field of Tanzania. God placed them there to do kingdom business. And I'm not speaking spiritually or metaphorically like God placed them there, you know, and this is where the, God led them or, or He put it upon their hearts. I mean, God placed them there. After a, a lifetime of ministry spent in the Congo, they were kicked out of the country and became refugees and found themselves in Tanzania. They had already done a lot of work in the Congo, planting six churches in a city without power, another 30 in villages outside of town, a grade school, two high schools, medical clinics, teachers' training colleges, and a seminary. But all that came crashing down, you may remember, in the early 90s with the genocide in Rwanda and the battle between the Hutus and the Tutsis, which lasted several years. And so they found themselves without a home in 1998 because of civil war. And they were in Tanzania. And as their prospects dimmed for their return, I remember one day Steve was traveling in Houston and came to visit me at my warehouse. And we were talking. He was so discouraged. It seemed as if a lifetime of ministry was was gone and there was nothing left. So I asked him about the opportunities in Tanzania. He said, well, Rod, there's something about high school and education But honestly, with the great work that we've been able to do in the Congo, it just doesn't seem that interesting or promising. Nevertheless, this was the field God had placed him in, and he had to evaluate his assets. What what had God given him? What was there to work with? Well, I knew that Steve had a degree from Rice and Mathematics, that by trade he was an educator. I also know that he spent time in D.C. working with NGOs and USAID projects. I also knew that he was one of the most resourceful men I had ever met. One time he had to get cargo way into a remote part of Africa and didn't have the funding to do it, couldn't get the funding, so he sold tickets on a Bush airplane. He started Vinton Airlines in order to pay for that cargo. So he was amazingly resourceful. He could out-negotiate any African and never offered a bribe, which is commonplace. And I think he started to realize that God had equipped him with experience and education, spiritual gifts. And so he began to invest in this field of Tanzania. Well, you know the rest of the story, don't you? There are now 49 Christian schools open. 10,000 students They've opened a college. Susan has built a huge HIV AIDS clinic and ministers to 1,300 people monthly. God placed them there. He equipped them. And He told them to invest in His business. And if you're a believer here today, can I share with you, God has the same expectation of you. He has given you a spiritual opportunity and He has equipped you with exactly what you need. Oh, you may need to gain more over time, but He has equipped you in the right place at the right time with the right education, with the right experience. Things that you may even think are challenges are things He's going to use and expect you to use to develop His business, to invest while He's away and while we await His return. You have a particular circle of friends and influence, maybe a trade. As we look about across this six weeks of a prophecy conference and we've been learning to expect Christ's return, this week focuses on what we're supposed to do while we wait. If last week was about preparing to persevere while we await His return, this week is about managing and growing His business while we wait. Would you pray with me and we'll spend time in this text together? 
Gracious Father, we thank You for each and every person here. We thank You for Your Word which brings life. And I pray that in these next few moments that You would help us to shut out the world. That You would remove from our, our minds the worries of life. The things we need to do today or this week. The, the tests we need to study for. The phone calls we need to make. That we would worship over these next few moments. That You would help us take this all too familiar parable from our Lord Jesus Christ and help us to understand it as the Holy Spirit intended. What a great privilege we have that we've been saved not only for eternity, but for ambassadorship in the here and now. To represent our Lord and Savior. To invest for the kingdom. To take the gifts and the treasures and the talents and the experiences and to use them for great commission investment. Father, for those of us who this is new to today, I pray that You would fan the flame of their hearts. That You would help them to realize what a great privilege and responsibility this is as a Christian to serve our Lord while we await His return. And for those, Lord, who have yet to place their faith and trust in Jesus Christ, may they hear the Gospel today that we are all sinners who stand before a holy God rightly condemned. We've earned a paycheck of death. But God, being rich in His mercy, with the great love with which He loved us, has sent His only begotten Son to take our place on the cross. In the great exchange, He's traded us His life for our death. But that saving faith, which is all that you require, repentance and faith, is not a faith that just saves us, but it is a faith that changes us and puts us into ministry. Father, excite us today with Your Word. Move us today. Spur us on towards love and good deeds. And may we take what You've equipped us for. And may we please You. May we honor You. May we manage well for You. And may we do it so that we will hear one day, well done, good and faithful servant. And all God's people said, Amen. Well, we've been learning about the purpose of prophecy. Prophecy is about not understanding all of the order and events and the countries and all the details. The purpose of prophecy, of understanding Christ is coming back, is to produce within us a readiness. We learned about how the, the steward was to be ready for his master's return and to be about his business managing his work. It's to produce holiness. It's to produce proclamation. It's to produce perseverance and great dependence upon our Lord. And this week we learn it's meant to produce doing business for the king. Now we are all so familiar with this parable. I mean, let's be honest. We, we all know it. Yeah, yeah, okay, well, Pastor, I've heard this before, but, but I found in my studies there's a whole lot more here than we think we know. In fact, I, I, I've learned that this comes with it, as I mentioned, not only a great responsibility, but a great privilege to understand that there's a reason that your pastor didn't hold you under at baptism and just send you on to glory. There's a reason that you have been given a new career, a new job as it were, a new position and a new identity in Christ. You have a reason to live. Yeah, eternal life's great, but you know what? So is life in the here and now. Three points are going to divide our time, and I've put them into imperatives so that we can begin to apply them immediately. Number one, realize the opportunity. Two, respond to the opportunity. And three, receive the reward. If you want to know the theme of this text, what we call the timeless truth, it's at the top of your notes. It's true believers maximize their spiritual opportunities while counterfeits waste them. Wow. I didn't realize there was going to be that, that punch in this parable. But it's there. Because Christ teaches in such a way that He not only gives us truth, He tells us what is not truth. He teaches what's called antithetically. 
There's a cost to following Christ. Salvation is free, but following Christ may cost you everything. I want you to look at a couple things before we begin. Look at verses 21 and 23. Tell me what jumps out at you. Verse 21, His master said to him, Well done, good and faithful slave. You were faithful in a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. Verse 23, Well done, good and faithful slave. You were faithful in a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. What is said over and over again? Faithful. Faithful. So a lot of you have asked the question as we study prophecy, okay, I get it. I get it. You know, things are going to proceed from, from bad to worse, but those are merely birth pains. But at some time before Christ returns, it's going to get really bad. And Christians are not going to escape persecution that we're called upon to endure. We have been saved from the wrath to come. We've been saved from judgment. But this time on earth is going to get tough before Christ returns. And He came the first time as a suffering servant. The next time He's come, coming as a conquering, what? King. But we're called to be faithful. And a lot of you have asked, okay, I understand about this. I understand we're meant to be ready, but, but pastor, what, is, what does it mean to be ready? What does it look like? Yeah, have y'all asked that question in your small groups? I, I get it, but, but can you explain to me day to day what it means to be ready? Am I just supposed to always be kind of watching? Am I supposed to think about it more? Well, yeah. Am I supposed to share the gospel more? Yeah. But what does it really mean to be ready? Well, that's what is answered today. And as we look at this phrase, well done, good and faithful servant, I think we've got to leave our baggage at the door. Have we heard this phrase a lot before? Every single Christian funeral. Even people that don't know where this came from would say, yeah, I want to hear one day, well done, good and faithful servant. But let's be honest. In the evangelical community, we never define what faithful is, do we? Because this is not talking about faith in the sense that He gives us faith at salvation. Yes, that is the gift of God, and it is the same faith. But faithful means full of faith. It's talking about a faith that works. We're not saved by faith plus works, but we're saved by faith that works. That master says, well done, good and faithful servant to these slaves. Why? Because they have worked in his absence. They have produced. They have managed his business. And so while I appreciate it that everyone wants to hear this, and we hear it at Christian funerals all the time, I think we've got to quantify it. Because if we want to hear that, do we want to hear this? Yeah, amen. We want to hear this. We, we can say amen. It's okay. Okay. We want to hear this when we die. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. I want to hear, well done, good and faithful servant. But I need to know what he expects in order to say that. I can't take credit for becoming a Christian. Well done, good and faithful Christian. What, what, what are you thanking me for? Because you're a Christian? I don't get any credit for that. He saved me. I didn't find him. He found me. So what does this mean? I like the way John MacArthur says it. He says, saving faith is a serving faith. That's good, isn't it? Saving faith is a serving faith. This text is going to take us all the way to the end and say, if that's true, if hearing well done, good and faithful servant means that after we've been saved, we are put into service for Him. We get to serve and manage the assets He's given us then antithetically, what about the guy that says, yes, I am a Christian, but doesn't serve Him? And that's where He's going to take us today. Let's look at the first point. Realize the opportunity. For it is just like a man who is about to go on a journey who called his own slaves and entrusted his possessions to them. Well, what does it mean when it says it is just like? Well, if you look at the previous text, it's exactly what we've been talking about. It's being ready for His return. We use that technical word, parousia, which is the Greek meaning appearing. And it was, it was the, the great pomp and circumstance and arrival of an emperor or a king. So he says it is just like 
being ready for His return. So what does it look like? Verse 15. One guy he gives, gives five talents, another guy two talents, and another guy one talent, and he went on a long journey. So let's talk about the players and the ingredients here. Three slaves with three amounts of equity. They've got capital. They get to invest as they wish to produce for their master in a long absence. But I've got to ask the question, what's a talent? Right? Well, a talent is not what we think of. Um, we think of, when you say talent, you think of what? A, a, a natural ability? You know, he, he's gifted at that. He, he, he's, a, he's a talented, uh, he's talented with music. Or he's good in math. That's not what it means, even though our English word means that. In fact, the English word talent comes from this parable, from this misinterpretation. So it was derived from that. In fact, the talent is the largest measurement of weight that we see in the ancient Near East. Specifically, it was a weight of a particular metal, gold, silver, copper, something like that. And then it eventually became a currency unit, a measurement of currency. By one account, it was 6,000 denarii. Now, that may ring a bell from some of the parables we've, we've learned. A denarii was one day's wage. So, if, if we were to make guesstimates about how much a talent is, you're looking upwards between three hundred and eight hundred thousand dollars one talent. That's $1.5 to $4 million dollars for the fellow who, who is entrusted with five talents. So a talent is a capital investment, an opportunity and a responsibility that the king puts in his trusted manager's hands and says, invest and make money for me while I'm gone. Now as we get into this, I want us to fight the inclination to, to say, well, that's not fair. How come the guy got five and, and this only guy only got one? This doesn't seem fair. Well, First of all, remember that one is more than anyone should ever deserve, even at $300,000. But verse 15 makes it clear that the master has an intimate knowledge of each slave's experience, education, and ability. And he has chosen to take his assets and distribute them as he wishes. He's not obliged to do this. In fact, he's very, very gracious. And can I start by applying this? The same is true in ministry. We have a tendency to think bigger ministries are better than smaller ministries or easier. Well, hold on, that's not true in business. In fact, I would venture to say running a small business is oftentimes much more difficult than even running a larger business. Or having a small amount of capital is much harder because you can only work the secondary markets. There's an old story of one of my favorite heroes, John Brown of Haddington. He was an 18th century Scottish pastor and he was a professor, and he was writing to a young student who had just taken his first pastorate, and he knew this guy was a little jealous of his peers. He, he, he knew that he thought that this post was a little beneath him because it was, a, it was a little church. And he writes to him, and he says, I know the vanity of your heart. Wow, that's got to hurt right off the bat, you know, a professor writing. I know you're a bit prideful there, kid. And that you will feel mortified that your congregation is very small in comparison with those of your brethren around you. But assure yourself on the word of an old man that when you come to give an account of them to the Lord Jesus Christ at His judgment seat, you will think you have had enough. <laughs> when we do the Lord's work, it is exactly what we can handle. And He will equip us to do so. I like what one of my friends says. He goes, we plow the field that God has entrusted to us. And we trust Him for the harvest. That means whether you have 10,000 acres or you, know, you have a small garden, that you pour over it like it's yours. Even though you're doing it for Him. So let me ask you as we get going. I want to immediately start to apply this. What field has God given you spiritually? What spiritual opportunity has God called you, because He has called you to be a believer, so therefore He has called you into service, 
What spiritual opportunity has He given to you as His slave, as His steward, to maximize and manage in His absence while we await His return? I mean, that's the question that this parable answers. When we understand it that way, it takes on a whole new meaning. It takes on a whole new meaning when someone says God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life. Really, what is that? Matthew 25, let's look at it. We want to hear, well done, good and faithful servant, but it starts with asking, what is the spiritual opportunity that we have been called to invest? Things like, where has God placed you to live? How long have you been in the faith? How much Bible have you been taught? What are your circles of influence? Who are your friends? What is your family like? Are they saved or are they unbelievers? What experience or education do you have that provides a bridge to the gospel? I mean, are you the kind of person, are you, are you an athlete that you can walk up and immediately con- start a conversation with athletes? Or an engineer? Or a salesman? Or a doctor? Or a mother? What time do I have available? What are my spiritual gifts? How's my health? All of these factors make up the talent that has been given to you by God. And you're expected to invest. Now the question is, what's the goal? Because those are things and circumstances and education and the field. That's that's the Steve Vinton, Tanzania, his background, his experience, his knowledge. But what's, what's the goal? What's the goal of investment? What's the return that the Master is looking for? What's the Great Commission? It's to make disciples. It's to help people know Jesus Christ and grow to be like Him. Let me say that again. The goal of investment, we might call it the profit, is to help people know Jesus Christ and grow to be like Him. You see, with Steve Vinton, the Christian schools are a means to an end. The the clinics are a means to an end. You see, he understood from his experience and time in Africa that healthy churches are sustainable. People come to Christ and walk with Him when natives come to Christ and plant their own churches, not when the missionary does it. And so he also realized that if I can impact kiddos with the gospel as teachers, then somewhere between K and 12 years, they become believers oftentimes. And then they will want to go and plant churches. So the opportunity, well, it's a myriad of things. The goal, it's great commission work. Let's see how each one of these fellows responded to the opportunity for investment. Look at our second point. Respond to the opportunity. Verse 16, Immediately, the one who had received the five talents went and traded with them. Circle that, traded with them. And gained five more talents. In the same manner, the one who had received the two talents gained, circle gained, two more. But he who received one talent went away, dug a hole in the ground, and hid his master's money. All right, college kids, if you've taken finance, what do we have here? We've got a 100% rate of return with two of them. And you might say 0% with the third one, but I'm going to challenge you on that because I think it's actually a negative rate of return when you figure out the time value of money. The two guys did an amazing, doubled their investment. The third guy lost money. So, the question is why? Is it because they had more or they had less? Well, I think there's some words here that give us a clue. The first fella and the second fella immediately hit the ground running. Traded. Gained. Those are very active verbs. Put in contemporary terms, these guys were up the next morning with double espressos and at their desk at 7 a.m. They were making calls. They weren't playing on their phone. They were investing and working hard. They were aggressive. They took advantage of opportunities. They bought low and sold high. They looked for fluctuations in the market. They bought real estate at the right time, reinvesting their profits, multiplying their returns, coming upon fields where the guy had enough money to buy the seed, 
pay the workers to plow it, plant it, but he didn't have enough money to harvest it and said, I'll buy that crop from you at 50 cents on the dollar. Look, just because we are saved by grace through faith doesn't mean we don't work hard for our master. Doesn't mean that we're not smart and wise about it. And these guys were industrious. You're meant to understand that this is an enormous amount of investment. And these guys worked it hard. Not for themselves, but for their master. I want to just take a a side here. Can I encourage us as as a church family? I see this happening with y'all. And I'm not just making you feel good. I see this happening. Uh, Understanding this text now, I see that we are becoming, like Ramesh Richard says when asked, what do you do? That we are disciples of Christ cleverly disguised as an engineer, a teacher, an athlete, an educator. I also understand and see going on day to day that people are using their opportunities for Great Commission returns. I see people using their ability to do desktop publishing to further the gospel. Their experience in business to help people get out of debt so that they have more time to disciple. I see people using their ability to help in real estate so that it frees people up to be able to host. I see people educating our little ones, using their administrative abilities. But like a good coach, I want to press us to excel still more because I want us to understand why. It's easy to get to a point to say, well, I'm good at this. I have this experience or this giftedness or this spiritual gift, and I enjoy doing it, so I'm doing it a lot, and we, we miss out on the goal of the actual investment, the return, the gospel return, helping people know Jesus Christ and grow to be like Him. So I want to help us understand what that is more, and I want to help us to be bold, more bold, in articulating the gospel. Okay? So if you have the gift of administration, or you're experienced in this area, and you are helping the body of Christ, that's great. I want you to understand more that the end goal is to help people become believers and grow in Christ. Let me explain with a practical explanation. I want to hear the guy that's helping in real estate say, do you know why I'm using my ability in real estate to help this person get a house? Because I want this family to be able to host lots of people and give them the gospel around their dinner table. Did you see that? That's investment with a view towards Great Commission profit. Do you know why I'm helping make copies and print this curriculum? Because I want the pastors that receive this to grow in their knowledge of the Bible so they can feed their flock better and people will become Christians and grow in Christ. Do you see? And I can take each and every one of your experiences and spiritual gifts and education and where God has placed you and I can say if I can help you see why you should do what you do, managing the Lord's assets, and what the goal is, that we will become better servants and hear that well done. Amen? That's what we want to hear. But what about the fellow who buried his talent? I would love to just kind of end the sermon there. It's exciting. We're there. you know. But we got to deal with this, this fellow who buried his talent. Now, that's not so unusual in the ancient Near East. Without banks, it was considered normal to go and bury something. You just had to make sure you put a little X marks the spot and and not forget, right? Some people did forget. It was in in history you find out that people would buy a house and be digging around one day and come upon great fortunes. Pearl of Great Price is a great example of that. But this guy here, can I just ask, what's he thinking? Aside from the fact it would scare you to death right off the bat. I mean, there's so many ideas I would have and so many things I would want to do and and things I would want to research. And while they immediately get to work, he grabs a shovel. Let's make some observations about this guy. Number one, he calls his master, master. So he claims allegiance, acknowledges that he 
is owned by his master. He is his slave. He is his servant. Number two, he takes on the agreement and the understanding that he is to work and do business in his master's absence. They have a contract. They have an agreement. He actually shows up to the office every day, goes through the motions, spends time on his phone, submits his expense report, meets with people. He eats the master's food, sleeps in the master's house, drives the master's chariot. And the rest of the village sees and accepts him as a worker in the master's family. But the truth is he doesn't serve his master. He is not who he says he is. He says, I am a servant, I am a slave of my master. But he doesn't actually do what he says he is. Let me press us a little more. Let's contemporize this a bit. He says he is a Christian and he speaks Christianese. He's made a commitment to follow Christ. He's walked the aisle, prayed the prayer. He's gotten baptized. He partakes in the Lord's table. He sings the songs. He goes to small group. He goes to church every week. He enjoys all that God has given him. But he takes no risks. He never witnesses. He disciples no one. His Bible sits on the shelf for weeks at a time. The truth is, he doesn't serve his master. Number three, receive the reward. Verse 19. Now after a long time, the master of those slaves came and settled accounts with them. Now that's interesting language there. The master comes to settle accounts. He's given them assets. It was theirs to use, but the ownership remained with the master, now he, he's ready to review the books. You old timers might say it this way it's time to reckon accounts. It's a day of reckoning. That's where we get that. You see where this is going? There's a couple of things to note with the first two slaves that made him money. In verses 20 through 23, there is a pleasure expressed from the slaves when they see their master again. And having multiplied his assets, this, this expression, the same exact expression, is used twice. See? See, I have gained you five more talents. I have gained you two more talents. These guys are excited. They're joyful. They've made their master money, but not only that, they've found real significance in their work, real joy in succeeding and doing well. I imagine the picture here is of a... A guy sitting down, walking into his master's office, having not seen him for, let's say, two, three, four years. And they sit down and he brings in the books. And he says, look here, I want to show you how I doubled your money. First of all, I was able to buy a container load directly from the manufacturer overseas. I was imported, able to import it directly. We set up our own distribution network. I evaluated everyone, every dealer to make sure that they were good. In fact, I completely slashed costs by buying our own trucking company and a fleet of donkeys. This is great. We've cornered the market here. There's also a pleasure expressed and reward from the master. Well done, good and faithful slave. You are faithful in a few things. I will put you in charge of many. Enter into the joy of your master. It's said twice. And we see, we see this relationship of this, this joy in serving and this, this joy in rewarding. We see it jump its banks. That it's not business language anymore. This is not, hey, great job. Can't wait to see you at the, at the Christmas party at my house. That's not what this is here. This is enter into the joy of your master. This is come enjoy my presence. Come enjoy eternity. We see a commendation. We see that opportunities of faithful service are rewarded with more opportunities. Paul talks about this in his letter to the Corinthians. I think Paul personifies this so well. In his last letter to Timothy, he reminds me of these faithful servants. He's about to leave this earth. He knows he's going to be executed. History tells us that it happened 
just outside of Rome on the Ostian Way, that he was beheaded, as was the privilege of a Roman citizen rather than being crucified by Nero. And he writes to his young disciple Timothy, who's pastoring a hard post at Ephesus, and he said, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the course. So I want you to hear the joy in his voice, the joy in finding significance in serving, serving a lifetime for his Lord Jesus Christ. I have kept the faith, and in the future there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. And not only to me, but all who have loved his appearing. This could easily say, in the future, I will hear, well done, good and faithful servant. I'm going to give you more responsibilities and more privileges. Enter into the joy of your master. Y'all, we have become so sanitized to this kind of language. We've become so sanitized because we focus so much on conversion, which is extremely important. And oftentimes, so much on glorification. But we're missing out on why we live in the here and now. And Christ puts this front and center, and then He puts it against a black backdrop of this lazy, wicked servant. Verse 24. Listen to him blame his master for his own laziness. Master, I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you did not sow and gathering where you scattered no seed. Are you serious? Not only does he insult his master, saying he was a hard man, and insinuating that he was underhanded in taking advantage of profit opportunities that he himself didn't actually start, but he uses all this to blame him for his laziness. Verse 25, I was afraid and I went away and I hid your talent in the ground. See, you have what is yours. And he betrays himself with his own words. Because if his master was hard and if he was genuinely afraid, he would have done something. His master says, you would have at least put it in the bank and got that penny interest on $100. Which I don't even know why the bank does that with me. I don't want the penny. Okay? But on $300,000, that would add up a lot. He goes, you could have at least done that. There was a viable, flourishing banking system during this time. But the point is here, we're meant to ask the question, what kind of person is guilty of saying they're a servant of Christ and yet does nothing in this life with the opportunities and responsibilities Christ has given him to invest for Great Commission returns? Let me ask that again. What kind of person is guilty of saying, yeah, I'm a Christian, I'm a servant of Christ, yet they do nothing in this life with the opportunities that God has given them to produce and do Great Commission returns. Verse 26 gives us that answer. An imposter. An unbeliever. Verse 26, the Master answered and said to him, you wicked, lazy slave. And in verse 28, he says, take the talent from him, Give it to the one who has ten talents. And that man faces judgment. Throw out the worthless slave into the outer darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. He says, you've proved you weren't really my slave. And as we look at this Olivet Discourse that Christ came the first time to purchase a bride and He's coming a second time to rescue those who have repented and believed and judge those who remain in rebellion. We don't have to wonder what this is. He's talking about eternal destinies here. So all of this boils down to the issue that those who have faith will be faithful 
with the opportunities God has given them with a view to helping people know Jesus Christ and grow to be like Him. But I can't end there. Let me explain why. There's a reason behind why one worked so, two worked so diligently and one didn't work at all. There's a reason. There's something driving the bus. And if we stop here, we've missed the real distinction as to why we work for our Lord, why we invest for Him, why we serve Him. And you know what it boils down to? The ones who diligently work for Him do it because they love Him. There's affection for their Savior. They diligently maximize their spiritual opportunity because they, they genuinely love their Master. He has not only saved them, but He's cared for them. He provides for them. And one day, He is going to take them home. Enter into the joy of your Master. But the lazy slave, the one who wasted the opportunity, why, why did he not serve? Why did he not work? Because he loves himself. And that is... In, therein lies the distinction between those who are believers and those who are not believers. Believers love Jesus. They love Christ. Unbelievers, just like all of us before we came to Christ, love themselves. And so the question I should be asking is, who or what is capturing your affections? Either you're an unbeliever if you're not serving Him, and therefore you still love yourself, or, or you're quenching the Holy Spirit. You're caught up in worldliness. You're, you're caught up in serving self that you've, you've forgotten your first love. That's a question I would encourage you to, to wrestle through. Jonathan Edwards, who was really uh, the catalyst for the First Great Awakening, when there were so many conversions, people coming to Christ in the, uh, in the 1700s, people were asking him, how do you know if they're real? How do you know if these people are really becoming believers or if they're just going through the motions? And he wrote a book called Religious Affections. And it was meant to answer that question. He said, you want to know if someone's really converted? Where do their affections lie? Who do they love? Time and truth will go together. Watch over time. Do they love Christ? And as a result, follow Him, tell others about Him, serve Him, endure persecution? Or do they love themselves. That will give you your answer. Maybe you're here today and you're saying, I, I've never heard this stuff before. I've, I, I don't know. I've, I've always just thought I was living for myself. I thought that was okay. I would just encourage you to talk to one of us afterwards. Let today be the day of your salvation. We all, as a result of Adam's sin on our own, stand before God who is holy and righteous. We stand before Him guilty. But Christ took that penalty on the cross. And He has saved us, not just for eternity, but He saved us to follow Him. That's why He looked at Peter and John who were fishing. And he didn't say, hey, pray a prayer. Hey, walk an aisle. He said, follow Me. And I will make you what? Fishers of men. I'm going to make you a spiritual banker, an investor. Well, Paul brings it all together at the end of his first letter to the Corinthians. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your toil is not in vain in the Lord. <laughs>